Hi, hi, folks. Um, again, if uh, you uh, please display your full name on your screen, the way to do that is to um, click the dot 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 menu in the upper right hand corner of your uh, window, and uh, then you should see a uh, rename option, and you can type in your full name. Oh, I see. Uh blue box yeah it's a little little tiny blue box you're you're fine you're fine don't worry about it So again, if um, as you're joining us, please make sure that your full screen name is displayed um, on screen. You can do that by choosing the dot, dot, dot menu in the upper right hand corner of your screen and choosing rename and typing in your full name. And we have two participants on phones and I'm going to uh, ask you to unmute and tell me your name and I'll type it in for you. So I'm gonna uh, uh, go with the number ending in 655. Please identify yourself. Okay, um, the, the caller with the phone number ending 931, would you, would you please identify yourself? If, if, if you don't identify yourself, I'll have a hard time uh, moving you into a, uh, into a room. David, please. Uh, is that the six? That's the 931 number? Yep. I'm going to be involved in a meeting for the next hour and a half, so I'm going to be in my office with the door shut. Okay. Okay. So you can skip the office this time. Okay. I'm muting you. Did I hear that you're wanting us to identify ourselves? Yeah, just make sure your full name is displayed on the screen, please. And this is Representative Mike Prox. I'm not finding the blue box. Is Mike Prox good enough yep, for your name? Yep, you're, you're there. Thank you so All much. Right, thank you. And this is Shelly. I was going to just say those on the phone um, may, might have trouble unmuting. They might need to be told they need to press star six. To, thank to you. Post. Thank you. Okay. The call. The participant with the phone number ending in six five five. 
can you please um, unmute either using the star six or any other features that you have available to you? Hi, this is 9655, um, Laura Skydolf. Say your name again for me. Laura Skydolf. S-E-I-D-L-E? S-T-I-D-O-L-P-H. I'm sorry, you're gonna have to say it for me one more time. S-T-I-D-O-L-P-H. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you. All right. Okay. Terry and Scott, do you want to bring up your cameras? You see me? Yeah. Okay, Terry, anytime you're ready. Very good. I just, uh, wa just looked at the uh, <laughs> wall of pictures and I was just impressed, the, you know, the uh, coming in from all over. What, what, a, what a great technology. Um, and I apologize up front if I uh, 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 start coughing and hacking, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll try and keep that to a minimum. But uh, uh, just uh, thank you everyone for joining us today uh, as we, uh, uh, look at the future uh, of Alaska and what comes uh, with this next legislative session. Um, we welcome to Commonwealth North presents the legislative agenda for 2021. This is Commonwealth North's 14th annual program with Alaska's legislators. I am Terry Smith and I am the current president of Commonwealth North and I'm just about ready to hand over the gavel to Scott. So looking forward to doing that as well. Um, welcome to our first ever <coughs> virtual legislator meet and greet this year. We're hosting the event online and we'll have our table discussions in virtual breakout rooms after the keynote addresses. I'll have more details on how this will all work in a few minutes. Thank you in advance for your participation and patience with this new process. And thank you, Winetta. Uh, as we approach a new legislative session in January, the state of Alaska faces a significant budget shortfall and other critical public policy issues. Our legislators will be asked to make important public policy decisions that will affect Alaskans for many years to come. Today's program has become a signature Commonwealth North annual event where we bring together legislators, our members, and other Alaskans for unscripted and open discussion. Your participation is vital to ensuring our voice is heard by legislators and that you know the criteria they will use to make decisions in next year's legislative session. Today's program is not a political debate or cross-examination. It is an opportunity to discuss key issues with informed, thoughtful Alaskans. At this time, I will introduce our virtual head table. Juanetta. First is Mike Bradner. Mike Bradner is a former Alaska legislator and Speaker of the House. He is co-publisher of the Ala Legislative Digest and the Alaska Economic Report. Tim Bradner. Tim Bradner is an Alaska journalist and co-publisher of the Legislative Digest and the Alaska Economic Report. Tim writes for several Alaska newspapers. Scott Jepson. Scott Jepson is Vice President of External Affairs and Transportation at ConocoPhillips Alaska and the President-elect for Commonwealth North next year. ConocoPhillips Alaska is also a generous sponsor of today's program. Thank you, Conical Phillips. 
And our fourth is Cheryl Frasca. Cheryl Frasca is a Commonwealth North board member, past president, and co-chair of our fiscal policy study group. Thank you to our head table. Commonwealth North was founded to provide a nonpartisan public policy forum to help Alaskans better understand some of the most complex topics impacting our state, including energy, education, infrastructure, fiscal policy, healthcare, and most recently, food security. Our mission is to educate Alaskans about the critical policy issues facing our state and to identify effective solutions. We fill a unique niche by connecting Alaskans with public policymakers for open discussions and thoughtful, deliberative development of public policy. Without question, 2020 has been a challenging year. Commonwealth North has strived to persevere and continue to provide value to our members and the broader community we serve. Throughout the year, we've maintained four active study groups, held one or more general interest programs each month, and undertook a remarkable first ever public engagement project with the Alaska Budget Choices website and presented the Hickel and Egan Awards to three outstanding Alaskan leaders. Thank you for your membership, your support, and the engagement throughout this past year. It's been phenomenal. As always, for those of you that are not members, thank you for your interest and engagement. We invite you to join Commonwealth North and support our mission to illuminate Alaska's most crit critical issues. On another note, for our members, please check your email boxes, spam folders, and the other electronic channels today. You'll find a slate of candidates to fill open boards positions. This slate was recently approved by the board, and I hope you will take a moment to review the candidates and vote on their appointments. Results of the elections will be announced next month at our annual meeting. Today's program is made possible by the generous support of ConocoPhillips Alaska, North Rim Bank, the Alaska Chiropractic Society. Thank you for the longtime support of Commonwealth North and this annual program in particular. It's the support of businesses and members like these that enable us to fill our mission and our offer programs like the one we have today. One of the challenges of these virtual events is creating a broad sense of togetherness and fellowship. Before we turn to our keynote speakers, I invite all the legislators with us today to turn on their cameras. Will all the legislators please turn on your cameras? One well, idea, do we have a final list of all of the legislators that have joined us today? Thank you, uh, Terry. Um, I, I don't think we do because we've had a few people join us. Um, but I'm going to call on Aaron, if you would, please, to uh, read through the list of those that have agreed to join us today. Aaron? Or actually, let me, let me go ahead and, let me go ahead and, and tell you who I've got. Um, uh, we have Representative Harriet Drummond, Senator L.V. Gray-Jackson, Representative Bryce Edgman, Senator Shelley Hughes, Representative Jaron Tarr, Senator Jesse Keel, Representative Ivy Sponholtz, Senator Laura Reinbold, uh, Representative-elect Kevin McCabe, Representative Kelly Merrick, Senator Bill Wylikowski, Representative Matt Clayman, Representative Sarah Hannon, and Representative Delana Johnson. And I know that we're joined by Representative Mike Prax. And um, if there's anybody else that we haven't mentioned, oh, uh, Representative-elect Calvin Schrag is with us. And anybody else that I haven't mentioned, please. I think Representative Zach Fields will be joining us. Okay, Representative Zach, Zach Fields. Anybody else that we've missed? Great, full house, I love it. And with that, Let's bring on Scott to introduce our keynote speakers. Thanks, Terry. Our keynote speakers today will be Alaska journalists, Tim and Mike Bradner. The Bradner brothers have been covering the Alaska legislature and Alaska politics for many years. Mike Bradner served as a legislator for 10 years and also as Speaker of the House in 1975 and 1976. He helped guide legislation, creating the permanent fund through the legislature. Mike is now co-publisher of the Alaska Legislative Digest and Alaska Economic Report with his brother, Tim. 
Tim has been a writer on state government and the state's economy since the 1980s after having worked with BP from 1970 to 1975 in the company's external affairs group. Tim works with Mike on their reports and also writes for Alaska newspapers. Today, Tim and Mike will provide their calls and color commentary for organization, issues, and wild cards that may shape the upcoming legislative session. So Mike, the uh, floor is yours. <laughs> I have to go first. Okay. Well, uh, we face a difficult legislature and we have problems like uh, we've never had before, uh, budget problems. And we also have unfortunately some angry politics that we're packing along with us. But it's important that a legislature organize, take its time and just the problems that we've had here setting up this form is just uh, one little clue uh, to the problems they're having, just communicating with each other in this process of organization. And also that they will have when they get to the capital city. But uh, organizations are important because they set the tone and character of a session, uh, good or bad. And it, ideally they should be inclusive. And that's not easy in Alaska because we have the smallest legislature in the country spread over the largest landmass. So it's really difficult to try to draw in the different regions um, of the state. And um, I think, you know, we need to appreciate you know, the problems that they have. And like I said before, we've come through some angry politics and we have to try to adjust for that. And uh, I'd like to mention a little bit that we've sort of made coalitions, um, you know, you know, something really bad. And that's a product of the last uh, year or two years. And there's a tendency to sort of feel like, well, that's the way we've always done business. But the reality is over the years, uh, we've done business uh, in a lot of different ways. And a lot of different coalitions who have operated in different ways. Uh, and uh, in 1962, we had a 2020 uh, legislature and they had a secret ballot and the Republicans won. Uh, and then uh, I think the master of coalitions and somebody we should appreciate is our late colleague, uh, Jalmer Kertula. And Jalmer presided over um, three coalitions, uh, a coalition of Speaker of the House and then twice as President of the Senate. And each time um, in the Senate, he had a 10-10 uh, Senate to deal with. And the next time an 11-9 Senate, on, but with more Republicans that he had to deal with. And uh, going back to the 1968 legislature, uh, he was a speaker of the house over one of the strangest creatures ever. And it was eight Democrats who were in the leadership supported by Republicans. And the deal was anybody who wanted to get bills to the floor could do it and you fought it out. And Jalmer even had dissident Democrats as committee chairs. And that was a real debating society. And it was, I think an example, you can let the system run free if, if you want to. And I think it was important because in the next legislature, we or next session, we received the 900 million, which set in place a lot of the things we're still arguing about today. Uh, so in a way, I think that was one of the most very important sessions in, in our history. And I think this coming session's got some problems. They also have to step up to the bar and uh, be one of the most important sessions, uh, you know, if they can. And um, I served with Jalmer and he, he was a very inclusive person. I mean, he reached out and tried to bring the diverse interests of the state together. And I think that's important. And we've sort of fallen into the tendency that the majority is almost the total legislature and the minority is, you know, is uh, sort of out of it. So, um, we have to go and do organize, we have to do, and that'll be whatever it's gonna be, and we have to live with it. But we um, have to try as individuals, perhaps to make that, you know, 
a more inclusive legislature and less acrimony. So that's all I have to say. Now we'll leave it up to Tim. <laughs> well, thanks, Mike. The, uh, is my voice coming through? I feel great. Uh, I was just going to make a couple of comments about issues that are coming up that, that a, lo a lot of the uh, new legislators and existing legislators will face. Um, you know, the governor introduced his budget last week. Um, it, it was uh, some interesting announcements. These are going to be some interesting times next spring. Uh, the budget itself was, you know, pretty much, you know, there were some reductions, uh, pretty much status quo. Significant to me was that he, um, he, he mentioned that he would uh, support the three-year commitment for the university, which uh, gives the university, uh, this will be the last of a three-year series of, of significant budget cuts, but it'll give them a period of stability after that. And the university is actually doing better now. Um, they are, their, their student retention from fall to spring is, is looking pretty good. And they've actually seen a 10% increase in new applications for the spring semester. So something um, they, they see, despite COVID-19, the university is, um, seems to be doing well. And that's, that's a really positive development. We need some things like that. Uh, in terms of the governor's uh, uh, budget speech last week, a couple of surprises were to, to a lot of us was the, uh, the, the large new permanent fund dividends that he's proposing to do. One would be increasing the uh, current year dividend the second one would be a, a, a much larger dividend for next year. Uh, the issue that this creates, which you folks in the legislature will have to face, is what are the implications of exceeding the 5% limit on the percentage market value? The governor's proposals will, uh, will create a 9% draw on the, on the uh, earnings reserve for the existing year, the first year of, of this dividend, and an 11% draw for the second year. So in effect, what we've done is we're, for the next two years, we'll be doubling the 5% uh, limit POMV that we've set ourselves as a goal. The 5% was sort of considered to be the sustainable draw from the earnings reserve of the fund. A lot of, a lot of financial folks feel that's really too aggressive. It really should be more like 4.5 or even less. But going to 11%, 9%, 11% .9%, creates a lot of policy implications. And that's gonna be, have to be something that you folks will have to um, discuss. The governor, you know, he feels that permanent funds has been done very well, uh, particularly this year. And uh, maybe we can take a little of that and share it with folks to kind of stimulate the economy and get us out of the recession. He looks at it as a one-time deal. And it may well be looked on that way, but the the political problem is once you do it once, it's easy to do a second time. So anyway, that's um, that's just a couple of thoughts to leave you with. A um, bit large PFD, that's that's a big issue. And it's something that's going to have to be looked at very carefully. So that's that's kind of the main points that I had. Thank you, Wanted. All right. Thanks, Tim. Appreciate that. Hey, so Scott, like next. Hey, Scott, before we uh, continue on, um, let me just make a couple of other acknowledgments. Uh, we've been joined by Representative Dan Ortiz out of Ketchikan, um, Senator David Wilson, and I believe uh, Representative Zach Fields is, is online as well. We'd also like to acknowledge um, Senator Kathy Giesel, who is uh, uh, online with us as well. So uh, thanks to everybody that's joined us. And let me turn it back to Scott. Okay, thanks, Winetta. Well, next up is uh, Cheryl Frasca. Cheryl heads up our fiscal policy study group that worked throughout the spring and summer to develop an online tool to help Alaskans better understand the state's fiscal challenges and choices legislators will have to make in future legislative sessions. I'd like to invite the study group's co-chair, Cheryl, to tell us about the project and some of the results as Alaskans around the state are using the tool and submitting their choices. Cheryl, on behalf of the board and membership, Thank you for all your hard work on bringing this tool online. I've had great feedback from both policy wonks as well as those who are new to learning about the state budget. I've had a chance to go in and play with it myself and uh, it's a very interesting tool and certainly highlights the uh, difficult choices the legislators have to face in this next legislation and legislature and probably uh, future legislatures as well. 
It's uh, certainly been very helpful in wrapping our collective heads around the state's fiscal challenges and the trade-offs and whatever choices we make going forward. So Cheryl, with that, I will turn it over to you. Okay, well, thank you, Scott. Um, and uh, good introduction to the website. And so what I'm going to do today is talk about some of the results that we've gotten so far. Uh, we've received, as of Sunday, we had 1,118 responses. And so, I'm, and they're distributed regionally. So I'm going to, to lay out some of the key policy issues that folks talked about. But I do want to comment though that, um, you know, we could have easily done a spreadsheet, an Excel spreadsheet and just everybody fill in the blanks as to how much cuts or revenues you might want. But instead we set up a website that the fiscal policy study group members worked on throughout the summer and we launched it in mid-September. And so we, we, and Aaron's gonna show you in a moment about some of the choices, um, the way we set it up and that folks work through how to close a $1.3 billion gap between at that time expected revenues and if the state was to continue the same level of services as this year. Um, so with that, Aaron, would you just switch us over to the website? Can you do that just for a moment? Yes, happy to. Okay. Um, let's see. Um, well, Aaron, bringing, bringing that up, let me also mention that we've been joined by uh, Representative-elect James Kaufman. Okay, good. Okay, and so what, what um, Aaron may be doing... There we go, yep. Okay. Sorry. That's all right. That's why I had you do it, not me. Hey, Alaskan. <laughs> okay. Okay. I'm Go. pushing buttons. Buttons are being pushed. Uh, all right. If it's not working, then let's... Oh, it's working. Okay. So if you go to the website, you're going to see a, a two and a half minute video about the challenge. And then uh, Aaron, click through to the page with the budget choices. No, no, the stop, start closing the gap now. Okay, and so here's the series of choices and information we've we, um, developed about current revenue sources, some new sources, you make choices, and as you make choices, um, it will tally how well you're doing in closing the gap. Um, so, so that's the... Um, the substance that's provided. So again, it's more than a spreadsheet and gives you some trade-offs that are involved and winners and losers. I mean, the fact is if you give from one, uh, take from one uh, to benefit somebody else, you know, somebody wins and somebody loses. So, okay, so so the now we can switch back to the PowerPoint, um, Aaron. Okay. She asks. <laughs> And so the, fir the first we're gonna talk about as Erin's doing that is on the spending choice for K through 12 education. And so what we did is we gave folks uh, five options. So go down to slide number two. Okay, so we um, gave them the options of increasing funding, the 1.3 billion funding by 2%, increase it 5%, reduce it 5%, reduce it 1% or maintain the current funding. And then here's the impact on the, um, the, the choices. So what did people say? So Aaron, next slide. So I know there's a lot of lines here, but let's just basically um, um, focus on the start on the left. And this is all responses from around the state, the 1,118 responses. So the blue line is increased funding 2%. Um, the orange is increase at 5%. Gray is reduce funding 5%. The yellow slash gold color here is 9%. And the lighter blue is 33% in terms of said maintain current funding. Um, so that gives you a sense of where all responses fell. Um, another take on this, if you look regionally, then we go, we um, segregated results by uh, areas of the state, Anchorage, Fairbanks North Pole, Kenai Peninsula, Matsu, Southeast Alaska, and then um, all other areas of the state. So um, overall, 
um, when you combine the increase decrease options in terms of the left side, the all responses, 36% said to increase funding between the 2% and the 5% options, 32% said to reduce funding, and 33% said to maintain. So really pretty evenly split between the three choices. So that's the challenge for the legislature to sift through um, those, those choices. But a better note is that on, in Fairbanks, you can see that 52% of Fairbanks and North Pole said to increase the funding. 51% uh, of Southeast said to increase funding and 47% of Kenai, excuse me, of the Matsu and 48% of Kenai said to decrease. So, so you can see different levels of support for, um, for K through 12 funding. Okay, next slide. The next slide we had, next program we asked about was uh, Medicaid and the current cost of that program in terms of unrestricted general funds, which was the focus of our spending, is $636 million. So the options were rollback expansion and drop insurance coverage, which would save 19 million, eliminate optional services, which is often a buzzword, uh, why don't you just cut that? That would save 239 million, whereas the third option was to maintain the current funding, so no change. So Aaron, next slide. So in terms of the response results, again, left of the black line, all responses, 7% um, said, I'm sorry, you can't see the, um, the, the key at the bottom of it, but the blue line is roll back expansion and drop the coverage, or at least I can't see it, maybe that's it. Um, eliminate optional services is the orange line and maintain current funding is the gray line. And so you can see across the state, really the majority um, is to maintain the current funding for the Medicaid program, which, which so, so regardless of which region you live in. Okay, next slide. So then uh, the third spending uh, area that I'm gonna just highlight for this presentation is the permanent fund dividend. Um, current year cost, $680 million. Um, so we gave folks four options. One was to use the statutory formula, which meant spending $1.2 billion, pay the last three years of the dividends, which would be spend $2.2 billion more, pay out the same amount next year as this year, which would mean no impact to the budget, or suspend dividends for now, save $680 million. So what did folks have to say about those options? Maybe we should have everybody polled before we show the results. That would have been interesting. Anyway, okay, so all responses. Um, blue is statutory formula, use that. Orange, pay back the last three years. Gray, pay the same amount uh, next year as this year, so no change. And yellow and gold is suspend dividends until the state can afford it. So paying out, the same amount next year received 46%. But I think most of us might be surprised that 37% said it was okay to suspend dividends. So again, we've got the regional uh, distributions um, around the state. Um, Anchorage is nearly tied, 43 and 42% for um, maintaining or suspending. Um, Fairbanks North Pole is tied about maintaining versus suspending. Um, so you can see where the other areas um, lie. Matt Soup, same thing, 33% say suspend, 33% say maintain. Um, so 57% so of other areas uh, would like to see um, paying out the same amount next year as this year. Same thing for Southeast. So kind of interesting, at least I thought so. Okay, so next slide. So now we're gonna talk about three revenue choices, income tax, sales tax, and additional permanent fund earnings. So the choices we gave on the income tax were 2% flat tax with no exemptions, 400, would raise 440 million, 4% 4 flat tax, 
um, 10% progressive tax based on federal liability, tax liability, 20% of progressive tax based on federal tax liability, or no income tax. So Aaron, next line. Okay, so the responses here is, I, I suspect it's no surprise to see that across the state, really the blue line is a no income tax, okay? But that's 43% statewide, but that also means then that um, the rest of Alaskans, 57%, were willing to have some form of a income tax, whether it be the 2%, the 4% .4 of the um, percentage of your federal tax liability. So, so that might be kind of interesting for, for, for those to look um, beyond the just say no um, bar. So, but kind of interesting um, across the board. Okay, Aaron, next one. Sales tax, we gave several options, uh, five options, 1%, 2%, 4%, 6%, or no sales tax. Um, in terms of the responses, um, next slide, Aaron. All right, next left of the blue line, um, the blue bar means 1%, orange is 2%, gray is 4%, yellow gold is 6%, and the lighter blue says no sales tax. So um, again, while the inner winner appears to be 42% said no sales tax, the rest are, are willing to entertain some level of a sales tax. Um, regionally, clearly uh, those in the other areas of the state say no to a sales tax, and that might be because many of the rural areas already have a sales tax. Um, so that could explain uh, the most opposition there. But um, anyway, so, all right. And then the final, um, final revenue option for this summary um, is on the use of the permanent fund earnings. So we gave four, four options to folks. Um, take an additional half percent of, above the prescribed percent of market value formula. Take an additional 1%. Take an additional 1.5%. Um, we did not have, or did we envision somebody proposing taking an additional four or five percent, but or, or follow the existing payout formula. So the results um, show um, the blue line take an additional half percent, um, eighteen percent. The orange bar take an additional one percent that received twelve percent of the people. Um, the gray bar is taken additional one and a half percent, that's 15%, and follow the existing payout formula, receive 55%. So it's interesting to note that across the state, um, it received more than 50% in all areas, except for the Matsu Valley. Uh, there, even the uh, follow the existing payout formula, received 39%, but it is substantially less than the support that idea received in other areas of the state. So, um, so we had, um, you know, it was interesting to, um, on the spending choices, because there was uh, 12 other, 12 other spending choice areas, and folks said, the majority said, maintain the current spending uh, in nine of those areas. Um, the three areas where they said cut spending further was in the university, they said to continue with the spend the $20 million reduction. And then the legislature and the governor's office were the two other areas um, that they thought a reduction was um, appropriate. And maintaining the current tax structure was the, the top choice in the other seven revenue choice areas. So next slide, Aaron. So if you haven't yet spoken up, we are going to continue to collect uh, responses and we hope to continue to make a report on what Alaskans are saying about these choices. And we hope that the legislature will consider them as they uh, um, debate and deliberate on the choices that lie ahead of them. But our goal here was to help Alaskans think about the choices and trade-offs and not just again, a, um, uh, a spreadsheet solution. So again, thank you to the Fiscal Policy Study Group for your uh, work on this. And thank you to those Alaskans that have participated in the, the study. And thank you to our underwriters who are no longer on the screen because we cut 
away. So thank you. Thank you. I'm done. Thank you, Cheryl. Oh, oh, one more thing. One more thing. The, <laughs> I know that's not a surprise to you. Um, the, the, this report is on Commonwealth North's website, as well as the same data collected for all of the choices. Um, so uh, should folks be interested in what people had to say about the other options? Now I'm really done. Very good. Thank you, Cheryl. Excellent. Uh, we appreciate your work. That's, it's a huge commitment. And and, uh, and just appreciate uh, your mul your multiple years on, on chasing down that and also giving uh, really the community a tool that we can use not only now, but this is gonna well live any one of us um, if, we, if we keep it up and maintain it and keep it current. So uh, thank you for that. We now turn to the breakout rooms for discussions with legislators. Please put your public policy hats on the goal of these discussions is to address key statewide issues in an open dialogue with our fellow well-informed Alaskans. At the end of 15 minutes, we will move each of our legislators to a different room so that they can engage others as well. Each room will have a host who will kick off the session by asking